Okay, let's begin it. Tracy, how would you introduce yourself? Well, I'm a relationship and personality psychologist and I founded the Inside Agency about three years ago because I'm absolutely passionate about a method that I've been creating to prevent hurt in relationships. I'm finding psychology really interesting at the moment because it seems to be the central or one central way of exploring everything. What I might start with is why psychology is important and why the psychology of relationships in particular. You know, this is absolutely my personal opinion, having worked in the field for about 23 years. But, you know, I think psychology is so important because people need to make sense of themselves. You know, they need to make sense of themselves and their relationships and who they are and how they fit into this incredible, amazing world that we have. You know, as has been quoted so many times, the quality of our relationships predicts the quality of our life. So the relationship is about that bond, about the connection whether it's self-connection or connection to your pet or connection to your primary partner, but it's the, it's the thing we most care about on our deathbeds. You know, there's been so much research done on that now. You know, people that are at the end of their lives, that's what they say is most important, who we loved and how we loved and who loved us. So that's what I think about, I guess, when I think about relationships and why I care so much about them and I care so much about people not hurting each other. Um, and if we could all understand each other more, there would be so much more compassion in the world. Mm. And that's what I want to see. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And also we're finding out that the most predictive factor of health through longevity mm. is the quality of the relationships you have in your life. Yes. Which it, once again puts psychology up yeah. there going, oh, we should pay more attention to this. This is important. This. Yeah. Absolutely. And important then if we know how important relationships are, it's utterly important to know how to protect them. And there is nothing... I won't say nothing. There's there's little education around early intervention for relationships so you don't get into those hard things. So some people will do a, maybe something like a prepare and rich course before they get married, but many people don't and they think that love is enough. I love this person and love's really special and it's rare. Okay, so you're talking specifically or mainly about what you would call romantic relationships? Is that a way to define it? Yes, in terms of what the inside agency mostly deals with. But I also work with mothers and their teenage daughters or I do a little bit of work in that space. But I think my, my great passion at the moment is around those primary relationships because if you, um, if you can prevent the hurt and you can create more understanding early on, then that flows down to the children. And as Daniel Siegel will say, who's the, one of the attachment experts, is that the more that more self-aware parents are, you know, the happier and more well-adjusted children turn out to be. So self-awareness is just so important. So focusing on the romantic relationships, yeah. and you've been working in that field for many years now, what do you think are the, the key problems that need the most attention mm. from a psychology point of view? Yes. I imagine that um, many people would answer that really differently, but just purely personally from my own experience, I just think that partners need to more accurately understand each other at the beginning because we, you know, as David Rico beautifully talks about in his book, How to Be an Adult in Relationships, you know, at the beginning we give each other our full allowing, affection, attention, appreciation, um, and we, we do that really easily. And then at some undetectable point, you know, our, our energy and our focus goes off the primary person onto stress and work and other things that has to do that. Keeping up that level of attention is, is, is you know, only lasts so long. And then we, we uh, then go different ways and each of us has an ego or a self-identity that we are wanting to uphold, we're wanting to have partners to see us that way and yet we also have a shadow side. So when the stress hits, the shadow side comes out and then partners start to think, oh my goodness, you know, I haven't seen this behaviour before and then they start to make conclusions about what their partner's behaviour is um, and then kind of demonise that behaviour a little bit. Well, I would never do that so that must mean and then they start to label and then they start to... Um, you know, maybe think that maybe I'm married to the wrong person. They've made up the wrong story in their mind and the wrong conclusions and it's heartbreaking to see that, to see the hurt that's been created from the wrong stories that they've formulated in their minds. And so for me, all of this comes back to if you can accurately understand the differences that there are between you at the beginning, things would roll so much, so much differently across the developmental pathway of your marriage or long-term relationship. But it's that accurate understanding and self-awareness to begin with. So you can have a rational understanding, I guess, in some ways, of the difference between yourself and your partner. But then you can have emotional reactions 
yes. those differences yeah. as well. <laughs> so I think so. How are there techniques or, or tricks to be able to convert the emotional reaction mm-hmm. into that rational understanding of the value of the difference, rather than going, "This yeah. difference is, feels horrible. It yeah. feels wrong. I'm all yeah. off balance. You know, yeah. our lives yeah. are not right." Because to, ha- to make that That's switch, you have question. to go, "Oh, that's actually good for us." Oh, yeah. it feels bad, but it's actually good. How do you yeah. n- <laughs> navigate that's, that? That's the magic. <laughs> that's that's where the work can be magical when you're working with two partners in the room and they start to see it differently because, it, you know, all our behaviours are based on our um, perception and understanding of what. There's the meaning we make of it. And if you can change the meaning, then all of a sudden the feelings change around that. Um, and so I use a personality model called the Enneagram um, and it describes nine, uh, and there's in a lot of ways more than nine, but nine primary personality developmental pathways that we fall into and so much science that backs this up. Um, and so when you understand each partner's personality developmental pathway, you understand what each partner's primary beliefs are, which drives where their attention in the world goes to, which drives their primary needs, which drives their um, what would trigger them if their needs aren't being met, if they're not being seen how they want to be seen. And then that drives their reactivity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to come back to the Enneagram yeah. in a little while. How would you, so a romantic relationship, mm. how would you define it as being different from, say, a platonic relationship? Mm. Is it simply that there's a sexual element to it? Well, I think it's more, I think it's more than that because there's a lot of relationships where maybe it's a romantic relationship but maybe they're not having sex anymore, you know, or it's but rare. But it could be like just implied or it's, there's something yeah. still sexual going on even if the physical behaviour isn't yeah. there. Well, I think your behaviours with the primary person is different. You know, think about, you know, apes that groom each other, you know, and they'll touch each other in a way or partners will do that. They'll touch each other in a way that you wouldn't do with another primary person. Like you might, might ch- touch your child and you, know, you stroke their face or do things really lovingly. That's really interesting because that is not quite so intense or common outside of the romantic or parent-child yeah. relationship. And, um, yeah, and even the rea- the way the skin reacts to mm. fingers moving across the, the skin at certain speeds mm. creates endorphins and things like that. Absolutely. And, you know, I think there's something really healing in touch. Um, but I also think there's, there's something really healing um, in, in you making sense to another human being. Like I think that's what I'm really passionate about is that, that, that we understand each other, you know, and you could have that understanding with a child, although all teenagers, I have one, you know, don't think you understand them. And we can have understanding between friends, great understanding. Um, but when there's that understanding and acceptance that whatever you say makes sense. Um, it's really, really powerful. Let's talk about the Enneagram okay. because that's a big part of your work. Sure. There's lots of content about the Enneagram out there on the internet, mm. but can you just give us a brief overview of, of what it is and what its value is? Yes, of course. Um, and this will be my personal view of it after working with it for a really long time, uh, for nearly two decades. But my understanding of it is that the Enneagram describes nine different personality developmental pathways, um, nine ways from temperament to adulthood of strategies that we start to use to protect ourselves. You know, we're born as an innocent little baby. We've been completely safe. And then when we come out, life is tough. You know, kids hit us in the, in the sand pit or we don't get fed quickly enough. And, you know, we th- so we have to develop some protective measures. Um, and from temperament, we seem to fall into one of these nine personality development pathways uh, that, that has um, a set of core beliefs, whether it's that I believe that I need to be helpful in the world and then the people will connect with me and then I feel safe. Or I need to be proper and I need to be correct and I need to improve things and I need to correct error and be a beyond a reproach and then I feel safe in the world. Or somebody where I love it when I'm, you know, just life feels really exciting and I'm really stimulated and life's really adventuring and I feel like I'm sucking the marrow out of life, then I feel like I'm having a good life and I feel like I'm okay. So we fall into one of nine ways of um, creating a safe life for ourselves. But of course, in doing that, we limit ourselves. We limit ourselves to a particular repertoire of strategies and behaviours that often get us into trouble in our relationships. So the Enneagram can help partners to quickly understand each other's inner world. Ah, so you have those beliefs. Gee, I have these beliefs about the world. Wow, your primary need is for predictability. My primary need is actually for stimulation. Wow, I can get, I can get how that has created a number of 
repeating patterns for us over the course of our marriage. Using it to recognise the difference between you and everyone else. Yes. To start exactly. with would be the thing, wouldn't it? Exactly. That's mm-hmm. exactly it. So it's like a shortcut. Yeah. It's like a like a word in a language that you can yes. use. Yes. yes. It, it's a shared framework and it's such a compassionate framework. So we always start with what's right about the person um, and that they make sense. Whatever their reactions are, it's like, why did my partner do that? That doesn't make sense to me. We can always find a really intelligent reason why they've done what they've done. Even if it's not helpful and the partner doesn't understand, once they understand the intelligence behind that their whole survival strategy, for example, is based on being able to be, you know, being predictable and looking for where things can go wrong. If you understand that about your partner, you start to, you, it just changes your mindset. You start to be aware. I need to be much more, more aware of, uh, of being inconsistent, for example. The value of an invention is measured by its usefulness, not its epistemological story of yes. nature. It's, uh, you know, it's not handed down from on high mm. um, that uh, the world is created with nine different types of people. The engineering part of me goes, <laughs> that doesn't yeah. make any sort of sense. But, um, sure. but as, a, as a tool... Yeah, it does seem to be quite useful, yeah. like any like any tool. Yeah, and I completely agree with you, and I think that's why I spent four years working towards a PhD to try and bring more science behind it, to back up all the great science that's already there about it, and there's more now. So, we're, sorry, yes. when you um, so when you go to bring science to it, mm. does that allow it to evolve as well? Because what, mm. what I what makes me more comfortable is the idea that something like the Enneagram does what any advancing field knowledge or theory about the way the world works Mm -hmm. Um, and it is constantly evolving in the face of more evidence yes rather than having having the science based on it that's where I sort of get a bit nervous oh um, I appreciate that that. and I I appreciate that and so when I was um you know working on the working towards the PhD um I was very interested in in that because really what we had we have is an enormous amount from therapists and organisations and practitioners practitioners within over twenty seven countries that use the enneagram of practice based evidence that it's helpful. And so I started all of this not so interested in whether the science behind it. It's about is it helpful mm. and you don't want it to be unhelpful. Mm. And it's certainly helpful. I've, I've just have so much proof in my own clinical work and therapists all around the world would back that up. And that's why I was um, wanting to, to bring more of this to, to other psychologists in Australia. So I'm just starting to teach other psychologists in Australia about the Enneagram because a lot are coming to me and really interested in you know, quickly being able to understand their clients. And because we still have, as a therapist, we have our own lens and we can presume and assume through that, even though part of our training is to try not to do that, there there will still be some of that. So if you can really understand um, the inner world of the person that's in front of you, of course you would feel like that. Of course you would have responded that way. I know it was really hurtful and harmful maybe, but no wonder you would respond in that way. And once they can see they make sense, then they can bring more compassion to themselves and then the change in behaviour or thinking or whatever shifts. So what's the main value of it if you had to sell the Enneagram to people that are, you know, a little bit suspicious and <laughs> sceptical and in terms of its usefulness as a, as a tool, mm. what is its main use? It's a way to deeply understand yourself and your partner from the inside out as a trajectory. I think about it like an inner architecture. So um, like there's an inner nature scene in you and one in me and they're different and they're both highly intelligent um, but they're different. And honouring honoring difference, we don't honour difference. You know, racism, it's dreadful. It's just dreadful. And so somebody who has the seven PDP in Syria or in China or in, um, you know, Chinchilla here are much more similar than maybe three different people here in Australia. And we don't realise that. And we know it's cross-cultural because we've done thousands of panels and thousands of interviews all over the world and it's used. Would it be fair to say uh, one goal is to try to move towards all the different personality types Mm -hmm. or would that just drive someone insane? (laughs) Again, it's a really good question and I... I really like it. You know, what I believe and has been taught to me is that we, as human beings, we are born with these beautiful essential qualities. We are, have the capacity for love, to be loving and to have an inner conscience, you know, so an, uh, a quality around goodness, a quality around strength, a capacity to be wise, these beautiful qualities. But they get transmuted into strategies and ways of behaving that don't often serve us. And each of the nine PDPs 
have a particular gift. One of those essential qualities is really particular to them. Um, and so, for example, the eight PDP, they are naturally strong, strong in mind, strong in spirit. But the self-identity is created around, so I have to be strong in the world. I don't ever want to be taken down. I can never be weak. I have to be strong. It's like they forget and each of the PDPs forget something that's really essential to them. It's like, so for the eight PDP, they've forgotten that they are naturally strong. They don't have to be in the world making sure that they show their strength. So once you know your PDP, you come back to what is your gift, recognise how it's being flipped in a way that's not helpful and be able to rest more back in your gift and become more flexible so that you can take on the virtues of all the PDPs and, and rest in those essential qualities and not have to go into the world and prove a certain way. So for the three PDP, they believe that they've forgotten that they're valuable, that the value is just in being a human being. I'm a human being. If I'm a human being, and I strongly believe this as a as a, a concept, like a, a, as a belief that every human being is valuable. It doesn't matter where you are in the world or who you are, or every person is essentially valuable. But the three PDP forgets that they're of value and they start to prove and strive to prove that they are valuable in the world by achieving and showing they're competent. But in that chasing the achievements and being competent um, to get the connection, to feel okay in the world, they actually miss the connection because they're so racing for the goal, they become not present, maybe competitive and, and and miss out on the very connection that they're wanting. So that kind of knowledge could be abused. You could, I can imagine a scenario where someone uses it to be completely manipulative of, say, all their employees or their... Um, um, this is one of those questions where you can just tell me to settle down, nerd, <laughs> <laughs> come back to the... <laughs> well, let's, let's try it. I've never been asked this, so go with it. No, I just... Well, it's like anything. It's a uh, If it's a, an effective tool, mm. it could certainly be... Well, tools can always be used equally. Yeah. To, um, destructively yeah. or constructively. I could make that comment about absolutely anything that we yeah, use. Yeah, of course. Any profiling thing yes. can be used. Yes, absolutely. Both ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And that just gives me more clarity, you adding that. And I, I have seen it used a little bit poorly in, in, in the early days. And if it is used as a party game or it's used as a categorising system, it is very ineffective and it can be harmful. Um, and so if it's about, oh, you've got the two PDP, it's not about that. It's about, oh, my goodness, no wonder I now get that you have the two PDP. No wonder that you've just reacted like that. I'm so sorry or what have you. But it could, could be used to pathologise or to say... You, you, you know, you, you shouldn't be like that or and, and stereotype. And that's where I think a lot of people, and understandably so, haven't chosen to move into the Enneagram or gone and seen its depths because they've seen it like a stereotyping, categorising system that they can see could be used poorly and it could be. And I'm really passionate about it not being used like that. Mm. And so those, te you know, the, the teachers around the world like me are passionate about it being used um, um, as a, a, with integrity. And I teach it like that, an ethical, how do you use the Enneagram in an ethical way with integrity, which is how I'd want to teach other psychologists about it and how I presented it at the conference has to be in that way. The Enneagram gives people numbers and then there's lots of nuance in those numbers as well. How do we get those numbers? <laughs> like is it is it genetics? Is it epigenetics? Is it mm -hmm. um, early childhood? Is it, you know, upbringing? Yeah. Is it um, in utero stuff? Or is it a, a lens that we sort of put on a whole bunch of those things together? I think probably that's probably a good way of paraphrasing it. And I think if you talk to any of the other, you know, scientists, you know, like Daniel Siegel, they're looking at temperament to personality and understanding that, they would say it's nature and nurture. And it seems like, you know, from temperament, we do fall into one of these pathways and there is a way that that happens. And of course, epigenetics is really important. So depending on the environment, it it tailors and modifies it. But if you start to fall into one pathway and that's identified by the time you're six or seven or eight or nine, tends to, that tends to be the pathway you stay on because it started to work. And then you start to attend to certain things in life and not attend to other things and then some core beliefs grow out of that and then those core beliefs further direct where your attention goes and then that develops into a self-identity about this is who I am. 
you know, which is your ego about, so I'm this, so I'm competent, I'm not incompetent, you know, I'm really loyal, I'm not disloyal. And we formulate a whole self-identity around our core beliefs and what our environment has taught us in terms of how we need to be in the world and show up in the world to be safe and loved. And then that self-identity then goes into the world and develops and develops all these particular strategies and, and has particular needs and, then, and particular behaviours to get these needs met that become really automatic and it's all unconscious and we don't even, or a lot of it, we don't realise how much we're on automatic. So the idea of understanding the Enneagram is to understand what's unconscious, to understand there is a whole inner architecture to how you operate And once you know that, you can choose to do some of those things you're doing, although you'll find that some of those are not helpful, and you can be more flexible. You can be a more mature, grounded, receptive person rather than a reactive person. We have all human beings. We've got all these ways that we can respond in life, but we've fallen into a pathway that's inflexible. And so when we know our PDP, we can then intentionally be more flexible Accurately identifying the personalities can be difficult. And so in the last decade, I've done about 2,500 clinical typing interviews, so asking this, uh, roughly the same set of questions to about 2,500 clients um, over a decade and then having the great privilege of being able to, you know, ask those questions, get a sense of it, hypothesise and then work with them to see if that's correct and accurate. Um, and you know if, if it is because it just lands on them and it make their life seems to make sense. No wonder I thought that about my dad. No wonder I was challenged with my sister. It's remarkably helpful. Mm. Um, so that's why I've, I've done so many because if I'm working with couples, I need to be able to quickly and accurately identify their personalities to see how they're how their interaction, to explain their interaction, the dynamics in their relationship. Um, and, it, and if it's an accurate, if it's not accurate, then it doesn't explain the dynamics. When it's accurate, it's, wow, it's really quite amazing. Mm. One of the things I love about these kind of conversations or podcasts in general, really, is you get little moments of seeing people um, actually thinking. And it's very rare. You almost never get it in media because most people are, uh, they know their field well and they can Yes. They, they can present their ideas as they have done a hundred times before. I love what you're saying. Um, so great. But, but this, just mm. this little bit of sense of, of play that can, that can yeah. go on. So anyway, that's a, mm. a, a, a long-winded prelude to a bunch of questions um, related to the topic. So with relationships, how would you define the role of love in those relationships? Or how would you define mm. love in general? <laughs> That's a really big question. And, you know, I love how David Rico describes love. He's written the book, How to Be an Adult in Relationships, and he describes that love is actually more about um, a state of being present. And I love that. And, you know, I believe that it's my belief, but that love is all around us. We can step into the flow of love any time, but we don't because we have barriers to that. And our ego is a big part, is the main barrier to love. And so if I'm just sitting here right now just really concerned about what you're thinking of me or how I'm doing, love can't flow through me. I'm constricted. I'm just, I'm, I'm being a certain way. So when we can relax that ego structure, first we have to know it and then be able to relax it, I think we can move into this place of love. And I think it is... It's, I'm sounding like something out of a movie, I think now, you know, it's the first time I've really said it like that, but I really believe that we block ourselves from it. I think that's incredibly sad. And I'll see a a couple work, uh, you know, that I'm working with that are sitting on the lounge um, and they're both facing directly at me and can't look at each other, can't attune to each other. And part of my work is helping them to attune and you can't feel any love. You know, and it's not necessarily that there's no love there because I'll feel it when it comes back in through them, but it's because they're in such a defensive position. So I think sometimes partners think the love has gone when it hasn't. Sometimes it has gone, but sometimes it hasn't. But their hearts just constrict in defence. And so when they can understand that and why they've had to defend themselves like like that, that there's an intelligence behind that, just two good people in the room, two good hearts but they're blocking the flow of love and we have to unblock that. We have to make them feel safe with each other again and be able to attune to each other and care equally about each other's needs. And now I'm getting into the method and I might have yeah. answered um, a bit too. No, that, I, that, that, that's a beautiful 
way of describing love. It's, it's, it's a it's it's one of those words that you just can't get a grip on. Yeah, it's a strange word. That's why I asked, and it's really nice to get to get your response to that. The world seems to encourage people to form relationships or to seek out romantic relationships and form them. At the same time, doing everything it can to make people feel like they should be in a better relationship. Oh, gosh, absolutely. If you were like emperor of the world, what changes would you would you would you make to the world that would allow relationships to flourish more easily and to break down less often? Yep. I love the depth of your questions. My goodness, so if I was emperor of the world, I would start really early intervention. So some of my work has been about you know, having to do the hard yards and seeing and being able to predict the hurt and, and knowing, you know, eventually developing a method I could prevent it. But I would go really early and I would be taking things into schools, you know, where little ones were learning around emotional intelligence and being connected to the feelings in their body and what those needs are underneath and being a, having understanding of other people's feelings and needs and ways of being able to, able to have conversations, even when they're little, around not, not setting off the other person's defence. And that's what we do, you know, in all these different ways. We set up the person's defence. Um, and so I would teach really early around emotional in intelligence and, you know, having these needs-based conversations. I'd, I'd sort of call it that rather than conflict resolution. I, 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 I think it's not so much resolution, it's more understanding the two people in the space. I would also introduce, I would, I would have everybody in the world know about their PDP um, so that they know their growth point and, and, and they know the gift that they have and they know their growth point and they understand why the people around them are different because that brings in so much understanding, compassion and, oh, my goodness, no wonder they reacted like that. That would be hugely helpful. So that's a, that's a really interesting way to answer that question, I think, because what you're saying is deal with the individual's understanding of themselves and other people yes. rather than tweaking the environment. As, uh, the yes. our environment is perfect. The environment is as it is and we keep trying to change reality. We keep trying to change things out there and we we project, as Michael Singer says, we project our face onto everything. We project ourselves onto everything. You know, it's not just a tree, it's a, an ugly tree or a beautiful tree. We just project onto everything. So rather than eliminating Instagram, you would say, yeah. let's learn who we are. I would say that and then it, hopefully... Instagram things, you know, there would be less bullying and there would be less need to maybe modify those social media platforms that can be really harmful, wonderful, but really harmful. Mm. You know, we as people would grow up. That's, I think, what I care about. We'd be more mature. We'd grow up. We'd see the gifts in other people. We'd see the value in every person on the planet. I care deeply about that. I just want to go back a little bit. You work with couples. And I imagine a lot of them have been in a, a defined, what's defined as a relationship for many, many years in some cases. Mm -hmm. What particular issues about relationships emerge in the long term? So when you're talking mm. about decades mm. that are foreign yeah. to us in the, early, in the early years. Yeah. You know, the biggest thing that comes to mind for me is growth. Like I think as human beings, you know, and other people could disagree with me, but I think that life is about growth and, you know, we talk about, you know, purpose and meaning and we all search for that. And most people at some point in their lives, you know, really start to question what am I doing and and I think there is a part of being a human being is that we want to grow and, you know, I'm, I'm actually just saying this for the first time, um, granted your great question. But long-term relationships are difficult. They're challenging and we know that and no wonder that they are, granted all the differences that we have. But it's over time that we can grow into our whole selves. Like we are whole when we're born. We just forget that we're whole. And we can grow into our whole selves. So we get attracted or we fall in love with somebody that's really different from us. And then over time we misinterpret those differences. We misunderstand them. And we think we shouldn't be together. But if you can traverse those and if you could honour those, your partner is in the best position, better than any therapist, um, they're in the best position to help you grow, to really grow. Because you've got, to, you've got to traverse a lot of challenges because in your primary relationships, all your core wounds are going to come up. All of your deepest triggers, all of your deepest insecurities um, will come up. 
maybe not in every single relationship, but that is the place where they will because it's over the long term. It's one thing they don't come out at work, of course, or with dear friends that you see in and again, but in that primary relationship, that's where it's going to come out. And you need to be ready for those. So we all have unmet needs from childhood that create wounds in us. Parents do the best they can. It's never about blame in my work. It's about understanding. But those unmet needs will be the very needs that will come out in your primary relationship that you will not realise that's what's coming up in you and you'll be reactive and you'll say something to your partner but you won't be able to cleanly ask for that need because it's too risky, too risky to risk rejection. And that sort of thing is a thing that can come up and create the greatest relationship rubs and partners don't understand what's going on. So my method is quickly understanding what's going on um, at the point of hurt. But ideally, can we please do it before, you know, pre-wedding or, you know, um, in the early stages? Right. So I don't know if that's answered your question. But growth and healing. So the biggest challenge in the long term is a lack of change. Yeah, I think that it can be. And so partners, when they've come to me and they're at their worst, they've been static. Um, They've been static or stable or stuck in this relationship for years. And it's really sad. And neither of them have grown. So if we we get attracted to a partner who's really opposite, then these lovely qualities that the, the other partner has, they'll help us to bring out those same qualities in us. So it's not like another person ever completes you, but another person can can help bring bring qualities out in you. We have all these things pushed down in us and so we don't reveal them. We often don't even know we have that quality. It's not revealed in us or we might have shame about that um, and we keep things hidden from ourselves and from others. Um, and a, a partner who's opposite that, ex- that accepts us and doesn't misinterpret us and misunderstand us can help us to bring all of that out into our wholeness. So I believe that a long-term relationship, and I think my method helps with this, is to not step on each other's core wounds and limit each other's growth, but actually help each of you to come into your wholeness and be your best selves. And not best selves as in an image of best selves, but all of who you can be. So you mentioned you wish this could be dealt with at the beginning. Yes. By when people first enter relationships. Mm. How do you know when it would be best to simply end a relationship? Yeah, that's a good question too. It's... um. I think when there's been so much hurt and you try to help people, you know, and I've worked with this, of course, I've had a few couples at the point of separation that we've turned it around and they've reconnected and they've gone on, you know, I've had a couple, a few couples that have come, say, before getting married after five years and about to separate that then went on to reconnect and go through their marriage and are doing really well. Um, And then some at the point of separation that we turned it around, but some that did have to separate. And at that point, I think over the sessions, you know, I couldn't feel any love in the room. Over time, I couldn't feel any love in the room and they'd lost the interest in each other's needs. And so it's, you know, I think, and again, I'm only thinking this now, but I think when you get to a point that you've been so hurt and your story, so it's always about the story in your head that drives your feelings, drives your needs and drives your strategies. But if your story in your head is that my partner is inconsiderate and selfish and you've held that for 10 years and in some ways there'll be a secondary gain to that story and if if the story is really solid and in understanding your partner's PDP and why they've done what they've done and that they have these needs maybe for predictability and yours were for freedom so that was creating a lot of tension, if you can't help the story to shift a bit, their feelings won't change. And they'll just be stuck in my needs will never be met. And they've they've got stuck in it's just about my needs. So I always teach, my method is called the couple DNA method or a tuned method. And it's like you can be stuck in an infinity trap of these are my needs and the way I try to get them met actively go against your needs and the way you try to get those needs met actively go against mine and we end up in blame attack or defend, defend. So if you and I were feuding, what have you, and I could get in touch with what am I feeling and what am I needing right now and wow, I wonder what you... I can see you feeling angry, but what might you be needing underneath all of all of that stuff you're saying? What might you be needing? And if we started to have conversations around that and I could start to really care about the needs that you have because we all have the same needs at the end of the day because we're human beings, but we could equally come back to caring about our own needs and our partner's needs at the same time, there's so much hope in that. But when, they've, when they're stuck on their own needs and have lost interest in coming back to care about their partner's needs and you can hear that and see that in the room over a couple of sessions, it's really difficult then. 
So there were problems with the relationships. I look around and I go, I'm just not sure they're worth the effort. Yes. Sell me on the idea <laughs> that being in a relationship um, mm. is better than not. Well, I think, um, like I think self-connection is utterly important. But when you feel that level of connection with another human being, it's profound. And often we don't allow ourselves because we don't get enough to a vulnerable state that we allow ourselves, me included, to to be that deeply known and seen without our armour up and to, to lean in and feel that love. And when we can, there I think there is nothing, there is nothing like it. There is nothing like that. And you know, potentially you could have that with a friend, but I think there's something different when it's a romantic partner because you're each other's primary person. So no matter what your day is or what's happened, you know that you have a safe landing place, a safe place to come back to. And I do think it helps in the in our growth area. So you can certainly do your own personal growth work and do amazing work in that. But I think we've got a partner it just helps. It's a hard road it if we want to grow up. It kind of accelerates it all, turbocharges <laughs> that turbo sort of... Charge, if, it's, if it's another equally a person who is mature and respectful and doing their own work, then I think it, I think it does. And it just makes it... It's, it's hard on our own. It's hard, you know. Yeah, yeah. I ask because these days relationships are... They seem to be fairly deliberate things and they're, you know... I have to we, have one. Well, we, yeah, we engage uh, in, right. in them very autonomously. So separate from the idea of having children, for example, it seems to be, have taken on a complete life of its own. There's a part of my brain that goes, but relationship is just what happens when you are doing everything else. It's not a thing. And mm. so the idea of mm. like, oh, it'd be good to be in a really good relationship, mm -hmm. to me needs a little more defining. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like that. Yeah, I think that. And we, we do. We talk about, you know, wanting to be in a really healthy relationship. And you have defined a lot of that when okay. you're talking about growth and meeting needs and and, yeah. and dealing with the ego. And I think I like those specific aspects to be talked about. Do you think it'll be possible to have a meaningful, flourishing relationship with a robot? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't. And I think about that really sad monkey experiment with little baby monkeys I think were taken from their, you know, mother monkey and they had an opportunity to be, you know, um, fed, say, th from a robot, like something that was mechanical and they'd get food from it or they could instead, they had to choose, or they could have this furry thing that I think might have maybe even had like a pretend heartbeat in it. It wasn't a real monkey. But they went for that at the expense of, you know, starving themselves because we... We need. We can feel it between us. I think there's an energy. You know, life is an energy, and you know, there's dust to dust, and you know, energy can never. Once we die, the energy is still there. It can't. It's still. It's still there. But we feel that within each other. That's what real connection, I think, is. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The question is an open one for me. Yeah. Right. Um, particularly with artificial intelligence, and as the more we understand about ourselves, what what how how we work as an organism, what makes us love, how we form different connections, what parts of the brain, what neurotransmitters yeah. increase a connection here and decrease a connection there. As those sorts of things start yeah. to become much, much better mm. understood, the idea of cre mm. recreating something like that mm. and then tweaking it so it doesn't have the, the faults and things that we don't like, yes. um, I think opens up some really interesting questions. Yeah, I really see where you're going with that. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, to answer your question, no, you can't. You can't replace people with a with a robot. But there's a lot of areas would be fantastic for artificial intelligence. I believe that, but not in terms of human connection. Working with relationships for so long, what do you think the role of the arts is in people's perception of what a relationship should be, or could be, or should be, or shouldn't be? Things like I'm talking about uh, mainstream arts, like books and movies and. You know, romantic relationships are a huge slice of the content. Yes. What effect does all that art have out there on the health of relationships uh, in general? Do you think it pushes uh, one way or the other? It's yeah. obviously complex, but yes, absolutely. Do, you have a, do you have a kind of a gut response to it all? I, I do, actually. I, do. I can oh, feel my gut kind of response. <laughs> and it, it leads back into the question that you asked earlier that I don't think I quite answered. Um, but but there is there are myths about romantic love. 
And it's really unhelpful, you know, fed by books, which we all love. We love the romantic book. Well, many of us love the romantic books and the romantic movies. And But it, it then a lot of them just, just are not realistic, you know. It's that we fall in love and then everything's okay. And we fall in love and I think you do need that attraction initially. You do need to fall in love with somebody and that spark is really rare and it's beautiful and it needs to be on it and it needs to be protected. There's a lot of harshness in the world. You know, there's a lot of pain and suffering in the world. And so we love to be able to go to things that reassure us and, you know, we fall in love and everything's great. We, we kind of get reassurance from that. So we all understand why those books and movies have been created in the way that they have but it's not realistic and it's really unhelpful and, and, and it's unhelpful because people don't realise that they need like an induction into relationships. They need some earlier learning around relationships. There's so much good science on, on what makes relationships deteriorate and what makes relationships thrive, not just satisfy but thrive, all this information and it's not being taught early enough. And, you know, I'm sure many of my other peers out there that, d that deeply care about relationships would feel similarly, that it's so sad that we're dealing with it at the point of hurt. And if we could change some of those myths about romantic love, I think that would be really helpful and do some earlier intervention um, and helping partners to more accurately understand what they're getting into and to understand that their triggers will come up. But that's a good thing. When the triggers come up, that's a place to heal. You know, a million years ago I worked in, you know, as a new psych, I worked in child protection and I used to think, why don't they have these TV shows where the parents got along really well and they were they were doing things in a way because the, you know, the parents that I worked with in that system, you know, were still loving parents but they weren't educated and it was generational and, you know, so how do we support them and they might not want to go to some triple P program or something and they're wonderful programs but, you know, could they be educated through these TV shows that we made them interesting enough and exciting enough that they could and they would learn through that. Yeah. When it comes to dealing with relationships, how do you think the world of psychology is going? Are there any sort of bright yeah. bright lights or are there any yes. gaping holes yes. in in psychology that you yeah. think need to be worked on? Well, I think there are, I think there is, and I think that's why I've developed the method that I have. Um, and I only developed it in the last, you know, four years, really, three or four years, and I've been testing it because there's so much work out there that's wonderful and um, some, of, some of it's generic. So it's all couples should do this, you know, and they're right. I think that the piece that's missing is, is just um, helping partners to deeply understand so that the two people in the room, so that the work is really tailored. And I know all good therapists will try and tailor, of course, to the two people that are in the room, but knowing the PDPs of the people in the room, bring information to the therapist and those two people that, you, that could take a year to find out or two years or you don't think to ask some of those questions to extract that kind of information, which is essential to know. So my method is called, um, you know, where I invite um, couples to know their couple DNA and DNA stands for the d, d for dynamics of your relationship are based on N, your neurobiology, so your temperament right through, and A, where your attention in life goes. And when they know that and their whole internal architecture, and I'll draw on a whiteboard like like an infinity symbol, how, usually when they come to me, they're hurting. So how each of their PDPs is trying to get their needs met, and we write the needs on the board, how they're trying to get their needs met, but how they're doing it in a way that's unconsciously stepping on their partner's core fears and core wounds, and it's not meeting the needs that never got met in childhood. So I talk about 10 things that every partner needs to know about themselves and each other. And that could be work that could take you a long time to find out. But I can know those things in the first session if we know their PDPs. And then when they see their own PDP map, um, so how their core beliefs drive everything in inside them right through to their behaviour and they see their partners, things start to make sense and they start to be able to honour the differences. And then we teach around um, from the uh, Marshall Rosenberg's work on NVC, nonviolent communication, and the, the, the flip name for that is compassionate communication. So um, how do I, you know, how do I teach uh, partners to be able to say what they're needing in a way that their partner's going to hear them, that they're going to get heard? And every partnership that I work with, and I'm sure every other relationship therapist, 
they're missing each other. It's so sad. I'll, I'll watch them on the lounge and I'll let them talk for a little while, not too long, because it gets into hurtful stuff and I need to give them frameworks within which they'll talk differently. But they're talking at a strategy level. It's like they're both sitting on the lounge talking at a strategy level rather than a needs level. So to give a really basic example of that, I had a couple where they'd been feuding for, they'd been married for about 20 years, had grown up kids. And I can blend this into kind of an archetype of a relationship, this sort of ones I work with. And they'd been feuding about lots of different things. But one small thing they were feuding about, which explains what I'm talking about, is that she'd been saying to him for, for about a year, I think, you need to take up bowling on the weekend. Bowling would be great for you. You need to take up bowling. Bowling is great. It's really good for your f- fitness. And he kept saying, I don't want to go bowling on Saturday. I just don't want to go. And this went on and on for a while. And then finally I said to her, what need in you would it meet if he went bowling? What would be good about that for you? And she said, oh, I'd get some space on a Saturday morning. Really simple example. But he said, he turned to her and said, space? Well, why didn't you say that? I'll, you know, I'll go bike riding with my mates. I'd, I'd quite like to do that. But I thought, da, da, da. And so they've just missed each other. And that happens in really big ways all the time where the partner will say, I've been telling him what I need for years and he just doesn't care or I've been telling her and she just, she's selfish, she doesn't even, and it's not right that the assumption that they don't care or they're not considerate is wrong, but they're not hearing each other. How do, how do people miss those things? They're stuck. They're actually stuck in an infinity trap where so I draw up like the needs inside one person and what their PDP is and the need needs inside the other person. And so, for example, um, if one person's need for, um, for freedom is really great and one of the PDP's need for sort of freedom and adventure and stimulation is really great and if the other partner's need that their PDP is about consistency and predictability and being cautious, you can already get a sense of how those... Um, you know, how, how there'd be different needs at, at, at the same time frequently. And having different needs at the same time is not necessarily a problem. It's just that the strategies that you use to meet your needs directly oppose your partner's needs. And so the strategies, the ways that we're trying to get our needs met, um, we don't say, hey, I'm, I'm really on a Saturday, I've been feeling really depleted and I would just love some space. How would it be for you if, um, you know, I had the house to myself on Saturday morning? Is there something that, that we could come up with together that would meet um, my need for space? And what's your need on a Saturday morning? And, and the partner might say, oh, my God, I have to rest. And so okay, how do we come up with a strategy that meets my need for space in the house and your need for rest? So you, you hold the two needs or three needs each and, and together you come up with a strategy. Mm. It's so different than the partner that comes home late at night to a house. She comes home from work, say, and maybe he's been at home working from home. He's exhausted. Um, she comes home. She's all fired up maybe and she's kind of wanting to go out for dinner and she's wanting to connect and she comes into the house and she says, I've booked a restaurant, let's go. And he says, oh, it's the last thing I feel like doing. And then she feels that he doesn't care about her or doesn't want to connect with her and they're just making the wrong assumptions. And you imagine that sort of dynamic happening in all kinds of ways all through the day over years. And that would just dig a deeper and it deep, digs deeper a wound. Yep. deeper yep. wound. If she could come home and say, I've had the best day, I'm really wanting to go out to a rest, I really feel like being around people and, you know, I'm feeling all fired up and energetic and, you know, really um, would love to just connect with you and have a bit of, you know, a bit of spontaneity and go somewhere different. And um, But how would that be for you? rather than I've done this and I expect you to come along, which is an okay thing to do, of course. Uh, and often partners might say, great, thanks, that, that sounds fantastic. But if she gets the response of, oh, my God, that's the last thing I feel like doing, she'll be offended. Mm-hmm. But if instead he could say, oh, wow, I really get you want to do that, but, you know, I'm feeling so depleted and I get you want to connect, I heard that. How about, you know, could we just watch TV? You know, would that be all right? And I'll give you a foot massage. One couple actually did that. And that worked well. So she felt like she was getting a bit of connection needs met. He was relaxing. And they found a strategy that worked for both sets of needs. Ways that don't spike stress hormones. It doesn't. I know. And neurobiology, the poor vagus nerve is, you know, we're constantly contracted in a state of tension mm. when we're in relationships that aren't flowing. So tell me about the insight agency. Yeah. 
I, I founded it about um, three years ago, so it's been running for about three years and it was sort of at the end of – I've been using the Enneagram in private practice for about 15 years and loving the use of it but knowing I really wanted to just specialise in that area and had been working on the PhD for, for four years and um, got to a point where I just put that PhD on hold. There was a number of factors that were really difficult and then I, I went through sort of like a, a bit like an entrepreneurial program um, just to, to help my thinking – the, the end result of that is the Inside Agency and I'm really passionate about it. It's, um, you know, what I care about is is preventing hurt and I do believe that we can prevent it and, of course, not in every circumstance but in so many circumstances I've seen. I don't want to keep working with couples married 10, 20, 30 years and hurting each other where they say to me, oh, my goodness, I can see this now. Why didn't we know this when we were younger? You know, it's devastating and then I say, but we know it now and we move on. But I'm trying to bring the work back earlier and earlier. But I've had to work at that end, A, because I really care about whoever's found me and come to me. So I haven't really marketed myself because it's just been word of mouth. It's been really consistent word of mouth because when people come, they find it so valuable. They get their parents to come, their friends to come. And it's been constant for three years in that way um, because everybody is seeming to recognise what I'm recognising is that we can know some of these things early and if we know them, let's know them and and, and honour them and honour the differences and not misinterpret them. Help them be able to share some of that and talk in a way that w- won't step on each other's core wounds, won't trigger each other so that you can grow each other and you can actually be more productive, meaningful, uh, loving human beings in the world. And I also scaffold all of that, of course, with the science of thriving relationships. So, you know, put people onto... Um, other great relationship experts work that we know is really important as well. You know you're on a path that's worth following when it's word of mouth that is bringing you most of your um, mm. work because that seems to me to be the most authentic respect for yes. what you're doing. Yeah, well, I'm stuck in the 1970s, so part of that is me I'd too. much <laughs> rather be, you know, face-to-face. And if you're interested, great. So in terms of sources of information, do you have any materials that you recommend? In yeah. terms of relationships yes. in general. I've got lots of wonderful books that I loan out to, you know, my couples that other wonderful authors, relationship books, experts have, have. Briefly um, run, us, run us through Yeah, them. I think they're yeah, all yeah, really yeah. helpful. Yeah. And, they're, you know, I don't want to leave any great relationship expert out because there's so many, but, you know, there's the book Attached. So knowing your attachment style is utterly important. Mm-hmm. Making Love Last, Julian John Gottman is mm-hmm. really important. NVC, Marshall Rosenberg's work. Uh, which is compassionate communication, is utterly important. Yes, I've come across that. Have you? Yes. Before, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, How to be an adult in relationships, David Rico, is brilliant. I just just feel like I have to underline every sentence. Um, And, you know, just one of the many fantastic Enneagram authors, Russ Hudson um, and Don Risso. And your website is? Is uh, The Insight Agency, so www.theinsightagency.com.au. And I think if you put Enneagram Brisbane in, that will take you to that as well um, because I'll be training, as I said, any um, therapists uh, in, in Brisbane or around Australia if they're interested next year. Um, and, you know, feel free to – and on there has my mobile number, so just call me. I just, you know, love to just chat to people and usually I've never had somebody call that hasn't then said, right, you know, I want to do this. And if they're, if you're hurting, then I really want to help with that. And if, you, if you're about to get married, please, you know, reach out. I, Oh, well, I can attest to having a conversation with you. It's incredibly valuable and oh, enjoyable. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much. So, well, thank you so much for, for, mm. for doing this. It's my great privilege. My no, great I'm privilege. Too.